I call to order the May 10th meeting of the Iowa City Board of Adjustment. May I have a roll call of members in attendance? Baker? Here. Carlson? Here. Parker? Here. Russo? Swigard? Here. Okay. At this time, I would like to read a statement which describes our board and our procedures. The Board of Adjustment is a quasi-judicial body created by the City of Iowa City according to state statutes. The Board's purpose is to decide on applications for variances from the zoning ordinance, appeals of decisions of city or officials, and applications for special exceptions requested under the zoning ordinance. The Board of Adjustment is an independent volunteer board made up of Iowa City residents and is not part of the city administration. We are assisted in our work by the city attorney's office and by planning staff. Prior to this meeting, board members received the materials submitted by the applicant, the staff report, reviewing the application, and any correspondence submitted by members of the public. Board members have not discussed the application or its merits with each other, staff, the applicant, or any other member of the public in advance of this meeting. All consideration and discussion by the board takes place in open meeting here tonight where we also have an opportunity to hear from the public. The board bases its decisions on facts and evidence allowed by city code presented in open meeting. Concise and truthful testimony helps us a great deal in our decision making. We wish, we ask that if you wish to speak that you come to the podium, print your name and address on the sign-in sheet, and speak clearly into the microphone so your testimony can be heard by all present and by our minute taker as all testimony becomes part of the public record. We ask that the proceedings be orderly and that when you're testifying, you address your remarks to the board. If this hearing becomes lengthy, we may ask that testimony be focused on new facts or on information not, only pre not already presented. The order of proceedings for each application will be an oral report by staff summarizing the issues of the case and staff's recommendations an opportunity for the applicant to speak, an opportunity for any other interested parties to speak for or against the application, an opportunity for final statements and arguments by the applicant and staff. The board will discuss the issues and evidence, state its findings, and vote on a motion. Motions are always made in the, in the affirmative. Thank you. Okay. At this time, Sean Harmson uh, will present uh, an introduction to Iowa City's uh, new FY13 FY28 strategic plan. Would you sign in and uh, give your full name and address, appropriate information? And I need a password. Oh. oh, maybe it doesn't even look. Oh, it is. I'm sorry. Like I said, if I forget to flip a slide, just yell at me. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. Uh, Sean Harmson, um, uh, 1420 Chamberlain Drive in Iowa City and a member of the Iowa City City Council. Uh, first of all, let me start. Thank you for having me here uh, tonight. Um, it's kind of, uh, it, this is the second one of these I've done, and it's, it's probably a good reminder for a council member to be down on this side um, to kind of remember how that interaction feels feels for others. And uh, um, I, I appreciate that, but mostly I appreciate the, the opportunity to come and talk about the city's strategic plan and to get to know, know some of the members of our various boards and commissions a little bit better. And so uh, as I go through this, um, feel free to ask questions. I will try not to take, I want to be, be somewhat thorough, I'll try not to take too much time. I warn you in advance, I'm not only a politician, uh, but I'm also a professor. And so two, uh, two careers not well known for, for brevity, but I'll do the best I can. 
Um, first of all, before we get into the st strategic plan itself, um, want to sort of explain a little bit about the process of how we came up with this so, so that it didn't just, it wasn't just a pulling stuff out of the air. Uh, the city council along with uh, city staff heads of various city departments uh, and, and other uh, members uh, in, as part of the process, facilitated by uh, some facilitators from EC Cog, uh, got together, uh, spent two thirds of last year working through this process. Uh, multiple special meetings and uh, special uh, work sessions, um, all afternoons into evenings, some weekends, um, to get together and sort of put together some ideas. What do we think the values are um, that we are expected to present for the city of Iowa City? How do we accomplish those values? What are our strategic goals? What are more actionable items? Uh, we started off uh, working through the various counselors, um, coming up with ideas of what, what our personal priorities were or the priorities that we felt that were important uh, as we were campaigning and transitioning into being members of the council. Uh, what we, um, uh, when the city staff was doing the same thing, the facilitator was putting this together. We'd come together, we'd have brainstorming sessions at the beginning where we would put all these ideas up, sort of compare them, see where some of them were basically saying the same thing, and start to build that idea of, of sort of some, some kind of consensus. Uh, also trying to keep in mind as we tried to prioritize and evaluate, uh, keeping in mind the resources of the city, which we'll talk a little bit more about resources in some of these slides, but as we, you know, we all have great ideas, we'd love to be able to do everything everything, but that's of course not feasible. Um, so then how do, we, how do we match up our priorities and values with, with um, you know, how do, we, how do we make the rubber hit the road, so to speak? And so those were our goals, our overarching uh, attempt, what we were attempting to do, and a, a, uh, uh, the ability for, for members of, of the city government to, in these, these sessions, to put forth these ideas, work through them, uh, do some back and forth sort of, sort of stuff, and also um, sort of, uh, Came up with a process that got us, you know, also kept us as much as you can with, with us uh, on task. So, uh, with that little uh, introduction, uh, let me sort of uh, start going through to the, let's find the arrow key here. Okay, into the, the sort of an overview. So, uh, a little bit about what I'm going to be talking about, sort of an introduction, uh, an environmental scan. Environmental scan in this, this particular context means looking at sort of, um, not necessarily the uh, environment as we think of like in terms of climate change or something like that, but the environment of the city. What, what things do, uh, do we have in terms of opportunities, challenges, and so on? Um, our strategic values, what sort of the overarching principles that are we trying to, to meet um, that, are, that are guiding us? Um, our strategic impact areas and action steps, um, looking at uh, um, kind of taking those strategic values and sort of coming down into more uh, concrete sorts of what does this look like? Um, at least to get us started. Uh, looking at the resources, what resources do we have as a city? Um, and we've got some wonderful resources and we have some challenges in that, that category. Um, and then sort of wrapping it up with how we get it done. Uh, one of the things too, when I was talking with the HRC and then now, now talking here to the Board of Adjustment, uh, one of the ways I see this as uh, an important document is it not only is for us to help us stay on, you know, sort of a planned sort of path, but also as a way for us as a council to communicate to city staff and to the board, various boards and commissions, um, sort of give everybody some guidance, some insight into what we think is, is valuable. Uh, what sorts of things we're gonna be using as we move forward making decisions, or at least hopefully we'll be able to use and, and, and come to a consensus, or at least a majority agreement that aligns with some of these things. Um, uh, so that's, that's sort of the, the gist of, of why, uh, another reason why I feel this is important that uh, we're getting out and, and trying to share this information. All right, so talked a little bit about some challenges and opportunities as we entered into this process. Um, some of these things, actually all of these things are still uh, very much things. Uh, we were anticipating some of the things we just saw the legislature do, for example. Um, the, of course, as you're, we're all aware here, the increasing preemption of local control by, state legisl by the state legislature, um, that's a challenge that Iowa City ha has faced for some years now and continues to be a challenge. Um, state property tax reform was, I think, just finalized last week. Uh, we knew that was coming um, and still kind of working through with city staff on what that's actually going to mean. Um, my preliminary understanding is we're losing the ability to do things like the library levy and the uh, emergency levy. 
uh, things that we have, uh, there's other sources of funding for the library, but obviously this, is, this is, impacts them. Uh, the emergency funding levy is something we've used to help fund initiatives um, stemming from our climate change in our uh, office. So. Um, higher expectations, yet diminishing trust in local government. I think we're seeing this, uh, uh, you know, as sort of a society-wide sort of a thing. Uh, you know, this idea of who do we trust and how can we trust them and who do we, what information do we trust um, certainly applies beyond city government, but we feel those effects too. Um, as, we, as we know, uh, uh, one of the things I love about Iowa City, I think Iowa City is the best place in Iowa, and I've lived in several places, but that's a long way from saying that everything here is perfect. And one of the things we have to keep working on and recognizing is the persistent racial and income inequity challenges that our community faces along with everybody else. Um, we also need to know that workforce attraction needs uh, the needs to get that sort of thing. So we get the workforce coming to Iowa City. That's important for us and for the businesses that operate in our community, uh, but also the staff recruitment and capacity challenges um, specific to uh, the city of Iowa City. Uh, we certainly are seeing continued COVID impacts, although the, I think the, this week, the national status sort of changes, uh, but we still have those lingering impacts. Um, let me give you an example, uh, office space. Um, how much of our previous understanding of the needs of office space, and this can de definitely affect um, things like a board of adjustment, office space are based on what, uh, you know, what we were set for before COVID. Now a lot of that has changed, and that's not unique to us. In fact, I just read an article in the New York Times today that talked about the available office space in New York City could fill 26 Empire State Buildings. Um, so this is a nationwide trend. Um, so those are some of the COVID impacts as we, as we navigate that, and what does it mean when we have major office space users in Iowa City uh, pulling out of their office space. Um, what does that mean for how we zone other new areas of growth in the city? Um, so that's just one example, lots of other examples. Um, of course, we also have to continue about you know, general inflation. Um, I saw that's coming, there's some good news on that front that is coming down, but of course that's meant an increase in interest rates which affects the city in other ways. Luckily, we still have this great AAA ratings bond. Uh, just last week we approved um, the bonding for several of our major infrastructure projects and we got a, uh, what would be considered a pretty good rate for that. But interest rates go up, that makes money more expensive and we have to borrow for big projects and so that does have an impact. Um, you know, uh, that also general inflation also infects th affects things like the cost of fuel for our vehicles, replacement of city property, vehicles, computers, everything. Um, there's a pressure there uh, on our budgets. Climate change and increasingly severe weather events. Um, certainly this is something Iowa City I think is ahead of the curve on in recognizing these threats. Um, and we have met several, uh, we've at least made significant progress towards some of our climate goals. We have a lot of work yet to do. Uh, we also uh, keep in mind, we'll talk about this in terms of resiliency in our communities. That's something as a council we've identified as an important piece of this. These effects are not going to go away. Uh, we can reasonably expect um, more of severe weather events and how do we deal with that as a community? How can we be resilient and, and bounce back from those? Of course, we just saw our neighboring community, Coralville, get hit by a pretty significant tornado not that long ago. Um, you know, we uh, just had another big storm come through the other night, and I think even after the derecho of a couple of years ago, uh, I don't know about everyone else, but I, I myself feel a different level of nervousness. I used to just enjoy thunderstorms. Now there's a little bit more anxiety that comes along with that, and, and uh, you know, I think that's, I hear that from a lot of different people. Uh, but how do we be resilient? How do we plan for those things as we continue to try and do what we can to be, do our part in combating the larger problem uh, of climate change? Uh, regional population growth and more demand for services. So this is definitely, um, you know, I'm definitely in the camp of growth is good and we want to see Iowa City grow. And I think as we see uh, even our, our fellow neighboring uh, communities grow, um, looking down the road a bit, that could open up some great potential for things like grants for uh, combined uh, transit, for example. There are certain benchmarks and population you have to hit to apply for, or to, to be able to apply for certain things. I don't have those numbers off the top of my head, but you get the general gist. So there could be some things as our population grows um, that, that that's going to, you know, kind of benefit our community. I have, I have a vibrant, growing community, that's what we want. Uh, but that also increases the demand for services, which, you know, gets back to the idea of having proper uh, staff, good staffing uh, to meet those services. 
Um, we always have outdated facilities as you know, in any city of this size that's been around for this long, we have different facilities as they age out and they get older and need to be uh, updated or repaired or replaced. Um, also looking at that population growth. What are the needs going to be for our community? You know, not just today and not just five years down the road, but with some of these big investments, we should be thinking decades down the road uh, to the best of our ability um, and planning uh, thusly. And of course, um, you know, we did, we have seen, think this is one of those uh, opportunities, significant influx of federal funding opportunities from the ARPA funds that we uh, have taken and we're still giving out in our community to uh, do various projects, uh, help various groups of people to the um, inflation reduction Reduction Act, uh, as that sort of goes from the big bill that was passed down through all the different uh, mechanisms of government to where it actually gets, you know, we can we know what grants are going to be available, we can apply for. Um, that's something that's very important. And one of the things that the uh, city council did approve in the new budget was a full-time person, just a grant writer. Um, to, to capitalize on some of those opportunities, uh, which will help our community, you know, do all the things we want it to do. Um, so uh, we've got sort of this idea of a strategy map. And so on the left-hand side, you see sort of the values that guide our strategy and desired outcomes. So partnerships and engagement, um, that's a big part of what we do here. We have a, one of the wonderful things about Iowa City is we have a wealth of resources here that I don't think every community or even many communities can, can, can take advantage of. Through the university being here, through various uh, nonprofits, we have a very vibrant and robust nonprofit um, sort of uh, community here in Iowa City and in Johnson County, uh, made up of people who are very concerned about the missions that they hold. Um, the city looks for partnerships with them, um, ways we can, can uh, create that synergy between the city and these nonprofits or other groups in order to provide a better outcome for the community as a whole. Um, climate action, again, talked about that a little bit already, so I, I won't go back into that. And of course, racial equity, social justice, and human rights. Um, a value of this community is making sure that you know, we all do better, um, that we recognize things like structural racism, structural misogyny, um, those kinds of inequities that have plagued, um, it's not Iowa City, but everywhere in our country for, for a long, long time. And not only recognizing them, but then seeing ways we can level that playing field out, uh, because as the late Senator Wellstone once said, we all do better when we all do better. At least that's, that's me speaking personally. I'm not speaking on behalf of the council with that. Um, how our strategy will impact the community. We look at housing and neighborhoods. Um, that is, you know, uh, our quality of life. How do we attract people? Well, we want good neighborhoods. We want housing and affordable housing. Um, you know, how do we uh, have resiliency? We have strong neighborhoods. Uh, that helps with our resiliency. Um, you know, we didn't get hit as bad as Cedar Rapids with the derecho, uh, but you know, we had uh, in our neighborhood, uh, you know, we had, uh, we lost a tree in our yard. Some of our neighbors had a lot more significant damage. Some of our neighbors lost power. We didn't. Uh, probably like many other people, you know, you're like, hey, do you need to put some stuff in my freezer? Do you need to come over and just, I'm going to set up a power strip in my garage so you can come over and charge your phones. Um, just those little things, those strong neighborhoods, you build those relationships out. And then when something like that happens, it's much easier to have that sort of on the ground immediate resiliency. Um, mobility, uh, how are people getting around in our community? Um, you know, are we making it safer and more uh, accessible for people who love to bike? We have a strong biking community in our, in our community. Um, uh, uh, public transit, uh, how can we make public transit better? How can we make it uh, more responsive to the needs of our community? How do we also deal with the fact that the transit ridership is another one of those things that we're feeling the long-term effects of COVID? Um, you know, we know we need public transit. A lot of the ridership went down, it's coming back up, and we're looking at a variety of different things, including a proposal which I don't have the details of yet, but we've talked about uh, you know, publicly. Um, the city transit is working really hard to present to the council a proposal for free ridership. Uh, which would be a huge step um, towards not just our mobility goal, but also things like our climate change goals, where we're getting people who are taking advantage of public transportation and not driving their cars back and forth as much, um, long-term sorts of goals. Um, stay tuned on that, because so we haven't gotten that proposal yet. It, it, it's, it's common knowledge that it's in the works, but what that's going to look like hopefully will be coming to us sometime in the next few meetings. Um, I'm really excited about that one. 
Um, the economy, obviously, we need to have a uh, robust economy, a diverse economy uh, with manufacturing and commercial uh, sorts of things and some office space still. We still have a lot of important uh, businesses that operate out of office spaces, although more and more remote, um, as well as the traditional office space. And of course, safety and well-being. Um, from the fire department to the police department to our mental health liaisons. Um, those kinds of public safety sorts of things are incredibly important. Uh, as we look at the growth, for example, do we have one of the things we're, we're working on in sort of our medium long term planning is uh, adding a fire station. And so we've already started to increase staff a little bit. So if we get to the, when we get to the point of adding a station, um, we're not going to have to in one big chunk, one big bite um, man that particular station. Um, resources, obviously, we need facilities, we need equipment, we need technology, so that's part of our, it's both a resource and uh, an expense, uh, but we need good facilities. Uh, the new public works facility is a great example of something that, that has become um, a way to sort of centralize operations, hopefully increasing the efficiency, um, also has some of our climate change with trying to make that a, as green a facility as possible. Um, you know, technology, um, you know, we learned, one of the lessons we learned in 2020 is how important the technology is even for basic functioning of government, where we can do things like have somebody uh, participate uh, from Germany, but also have other people participate and watch us online and interact, uh, despite the circumstances. We just had during that, the same night that, uh, or a week after the tornado hit Coralville, we had warnings for uh, more thun or tornado watches, and, and they were warning of a lot of that stuff. And we had a council meeting, and so we were able to keep the public safe hold our council meeting, yet still have the public be able to access it online. Not ideal, but rather than having this room packed full of people with a big glass window and a tornado coming through, uh, we were able to meet the needs of our local government obligations as well as keep the public safe and the ability to engage with us. So technology. Um, people. We need people. Like everybody else, uh, the city of Iowa City uh, does have some challenges uh, recruiting and retaining personnel at all levels. We need good people to offer good services to the good people of our city. Um, and so we have to make sure that we are uh, working in ways um, and directing staff to work in ways to um, be good employers. Um, that's a good ethical position to take both this in this practical sense, but also in, in the city can set the bar for what we find acceptable in terms of how we expect our businesses to behave um, and operate in our community. Certainly we can't give ourselves a lower standard than what we want other people to do um, if we're going to be leaders in that way. Um, and then, of course, the financial part of it, as we work through figuring out what the impact of the, uh, the various uh, changes they're making in Des Moines in property taxes, um, what impact that's going to have, what other opportunities there are going to be, um, and also being smart about the accounting. Um, one of the things that I think, and I, and I think this is, uh, I like to offer praise where praise is due, um, our city uh, administration and, and uh, budget office and city manager's office have seen some of these things coming for, for many years now. I remember back when I was uh, working with uh, uh, Maza here on her campaign for city council and sitting through some meetings, knowing that some of these changes in property tax that have taken place were coming um, in terms of the commercial way the commercial property and, and, and rental properties are taxed. I won't go into that. That's a whole other meeting, um, which many of you probably already are aware of. Uh, but there was pre-planning and an emergency reserve. So when we got to this latest session and we got to January, February, and March, when there was just a lot of discussion about big changes coming from Des Moines, but we didn't know what was gonna happen, but oh, by the way, you have to get your budget in by this deadline. Um, we were able to do so in a way that we weren't scrambling to make cuts. We could, we had, uh, because of these, these financial practices, we had a cushion and so we were able to say, okay, we can, can put through the budget we think we need to do with the spending we think we need to do to meet our goals and meet the services of the city, wait till we find stuff out, and then we can take, we'll have time to take a look at things. And so that's, um, again, that's one of the things I just wanted to offer that uh, bit of gratitude, and that's why having good personnel and good people on staff is, can be so important. All right, values. Um, kind of mentioned this already a, a little bit. Um, oh, one more slide, there we go. Um, racial equity, social justice, and human rights, um, uh, climate action, partnerships, and engagement. And our values represent the lens through which we'll approach our work, um, as well as the desired state when our work is completed. So part of this is kind of having in mind what does it look like uh, to have succeeded. Um, on to the next slide, please. 
Um, so how will we know if we've done some of the things? So for, in the terms of the racial justice, uh, now some of these things, at least I recognize as being in progress, which is great, but we should never, we should celebrate our wins without ever thinking that means the job is done, which is sometimes a difficult line to walk, uh, but an important line to walk. So when our community fully celebrates and welcomes cultural diversity, right? We can recognize some of that already. We, we can do more. Our community acknowledges and commemorates accurate historical cultural perspectives. Um, Really, I, I think one of the things about this and that particular one is we were making this a year ago. Um, and then think about what's happened since last fall to today with our, in our state about people not wanting to have a uh, accuracy and uh, the uh, accurate historical cultural perspectives. Um, how interesting that, uh, you know, uh, that this was something that we had keyed in on and that uh, some folks in Des Moines have, have keyed in the opposite direction. Um, every resident understands how these systemic inequities have disadvantaged some populations and have the skills then to disrupt that bias. So being awareness is first key, but then how do we how do we make sure that people are empowered to disrupt that? And what does that look like? And it looks like different things in different situations. Um, the systemic barriers in policies, programs, and services are proactively addressed. So rather than waiting, always waiting for a problem to come forward, um, you know, that we want city staff and members of the council and boards and commissions to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm noticing this, and I think maybe we, this, we could be doing this better. This seems like this could be a, a problem that was baked into the system that, you know, right now we don't have somebody having a problem with it, but we should maybe think about this, you know, proactively. Um, we build those partnerships that facilitate equal access and opportunity, and, and Iowa City, and again, you recognize these are in progress kinds of things, right? So whether we're helping um, uh, previously uh, underestimated uh, um, classes of people to start their entrepreneurship, um, South District work, all kinds of different things that we do in partnership. The city doesn't, can't do these things alone, but we can, working with others, we can sure facilitate a lot of really great things. Um, community decision makers reflect the diversity of the community. So whether it's boards, commissions, other sorts of things, uh, the more we can get uh, all, of, all of our various entities and bodies to look like a representative across section of the community, the better we're going we're to be able to do our jobs. Because we all bring different lenses, experiences, and perspectives. Uh, and the more rich and, and vibrant we can make that tapestry of our community show up in the tapestry of things like our city government, the, I think the better off we'll be. And the more resilient and healthy we'll be as a community moving forward. Um, equity, inclusion, and belonging is clearly identified at all city operations and activities. Um, you know, so those things maybe even we're not aware of that, we're, that, we, that we might do that, are, that make other people feel excluded. Um, those are important conversations to have, but we have to be the kind of place where people can feel safe coming forward and saying, hey, this particular thing um, is, uh, doesn't make me or members of my community feel like we're being included. Um, the thing is, somebody who looks like me doesn't always know that, right? I don't have those experiences, but I, hopefully I project and others in our city will project the idea that, hey, we're willing to learn, willing to listen. Um, and that's one piece of that puzzle. Um, what about climate action? Well, um, the world looks uh, to Iowa City to copy our innovative carbon reduction strategies. Um, that's, that is a pretty, uh, that is something that, that we, like I said, we're kind of cutting edge um, in terms of Iowa cities that, that have devoted resources to having staff, full-time staff, that look at these issues and come up with initiatives and evaluate different initiatives and proposals that come to us as a council. Um, that, is, that is an innovation, and I think that's a, that's a good one and something we should be proud of and continue to, uh, to, to do that. Um, net zero greenhouse gas uh, emissions are achieved across all sectors. We've made good progress on that. Uh, we're ahead of our timeline, but uh, we still need to keep pushing on that. Um, some of the future things we'll need to do is looking at some of those uh, uh, building sorts of things, um, in, in, you know, the in-building versus, um, uh, like for instance, one of the big things that we were successful doing was working out a deal with uh, the, the uh, energy pr company that provides a lot of electricity for Iowa City and trying to get a, a lot of that, a, high, a large percentage of that coming from renewable sources like wind. Um, but that's, you know, there's other lots of other things. Every household is prepared uh, for extreme heat, cold, and weather events uh, caused by climate change. Um, you know, We'll see, I mean, we, you know, when we have uh, big climate events, if we have a long stretch of very hot weather, um, there are people that can't afford air conditioning. 
Um, maybe uh, there are different kinds of things uh, that we can do as a city uh, that helps them survive that, but also helps people over time put on things like, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe, sol maybe it's solar panels, maybe it's something else, um, because we can expect that. We should make plans now planning for those eventualities. Um, we want to have a biodiverse environment uh, found through our, out throughout our community. Um, our children's, and a lot of this, you know, this hits home, I think, for all of us, whether we have children or grandchildren or not, but maybe hits in different ways. But our children's water, air, and soil quality is better than it was for us. Um, and again, that is, that is a huge deal. Uh, I don't know if, uh, you know, I, I consume a lot of news. One of the ways Iowa was in the news recently as we have risen to second in the nation in the rate of new cases of cancer. Um, we have, uh, I think we can, you know, uh, there'll be a lot of studies done to try and track that down. But I think as a starting point, um, it would not be foolish to wonder about the environmental uh, things about Iowa, such as our heavy use of, of the agricultural industry, pesticides, herbicides, et cetera, et cetera. What impact all of those things have in our air, ground, uh, and, and water. Uh, residents choose to take climate action, such as riding the bus, talked about that a little bit already, uh, shopping locally, and conserving energy. So ways we can promote those kinds of things, partially through providing services that are accessible and, and financially as well as physically, um, and uh, you know, um, shopping locally. So that sort of becomes a synergistic sort of effect with some of our other goals. Um, health, safety, and sense of community are improved for all. So again, that uh, resiliency when it comes to these kinds of things. All right, finally, how do we know if we achieve our vision for partnerships and engagement? Well, the public believe opportunities for public input are worthwhile and sincere. Um, you know, uh, as we all know, not everybody, uh, some people confuse being heard with being agreed with. Um, we need to make sure that we are, we are hearing everybody. We're never going to be able to agree with everybody. Um, I'm sure in a board like this, you're used to people having varying opinions, and you have to make it, we have to make a choice. But the people that come before us, hopefully, will, will be heard and will recognize that they have been heard through that process. Um, because we want people to continue to, even if, even if they come and, and maybe as a, as a council or as a, as a board, uh, we disagree with them today, we want them to come back and still be engaged. Because maybe the next time, it's going to go a different way, and that'll be important for us. Um, Public dialogue is respectful. Again, not not uh, you know telling anybody here anything they don't know, but one of the sad characteristics of the public dialogue over the last several years, uh, and it seems to be getting increasingly worse, is that uh, people can uh, good people can should be able to disagree and not be overly disagreeable. Now, I don't want to say that people shouldn't have passion, um, that they shouldn't shouldn't have that sort of energy because that drives change and that's important. Um, but we don't see everybody, even you know, that comes before any any sort of our area of our society. We certainly see people that come forth not in good faith with passion, but in bad faith, um, and, and then kind of disrupt this idea of dialogue. But we can set the tone for that sort of uh, response respectable, um, a respectful sort of dialogue. Um, decision making is transparent. Um, I think that's, that's incredibly important for all of us, and we live under those sorts of rules with our open meetings and open records. Um, so we embody that structurally, but also in the way that we sort of explain ourselves and our decisions. Um, one of the goals is that every resident is routinely reached by the city in a way that aligns with their preferred method of communication. That's a tough one, because not everybody like pays attention to the same thing. Uh, some people are avid consumers of the news. Some people like radio. Some people like the newspaper. Uh, some people look for stuff online. Maybe they're on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Um, other times, maybe the you know for some people, it's uh, unless it shows up uh, in a flyer with their water bill, um, that might be the way. So looking at these various different ways, but having a variety of, of ways to do that and reaching out to people, not just assuming people will tune in and watch our meetings. Turns out these meetings can be a little dry sometimes, and so um, and people are busy. Uh, neighborhoods uh, are a source of the grassroots community building and prosperity. So we look at different ways, like our community grants, um, in order to help, uh, or neighborhood grants rather, to help build that sense of community among our various uh, neighborhoods. Uh, Iowa City has kind of this rich, uh, also a rich tapestry of different neighborhoods and different fields, whether we're talking about the north side, uh, the south side, the east side, uh, various other places in there. Uh, sometimes, you know, they run around particular schools. Sometimes, you know, you have, have people sort of identify in that way. Uh, 
Um, and that's kind of kind of nice to have that sort of people can be have that sort of that local pride within the larger local pride of being in Iowa City, and the city can help can help with those by by, by even things like little neighborhood grants and, and, and that we can do. Um, community stakeholders should trust and openly communicate with the city. Um, again. We need that sort of back and forth of communication. None of us knows everything. Uh, if we get a lot of input, we're more likely to make good decisions. Um, and public-private partnerships are common and a natural component of every solution. Um, you know, sometimes there are things that the public entities, uh, public government is just better suited to do. Um, other times we can do that sort of partnership, uh, private, private or, or nonprofit. Um, for things ranging from uh, providing mental health care services to people in crisis, um, all the way to you know how do we market our city uh, effectively. All right. Um, so examples of how to carry out these values uh, for a border commission. Um, so just as as we look at it, and I'm, I'm going to not go through with a ton of these now. Uh, let me see here. So. As you think about how this applies, these, these various things apply, I think uh, for something like this, um, yeah, everything always overlaps, right? So there's no clean demarcations. But I think if I had to, to pull it out in, in the uh, slide of, um, oh, if you want to go ahead uh, to the uh, slide entitled Impact Areas, it's about two or three down. There we go, that one. That one. So I think the neighborhoods and housing is the one that seems to me to be the most logical um, when you take a look at the zoning and so, uh, and, and adjustments and changes to the zoning. Um, you know, and so do those changes, whether they're granted or not, how does that fit into the bigger picture? And of course, that's why we have commission members who can, can do that because it's never quite so simple. You put something down on paper and then paper meets reality and it's messy, right? There's a messiness to that and that's why we have uh, good people like yourselves who are willing to donate your time and volu basically volunteer for this work uh, because you also feel that there is a value to the community, you want to serve your community, um, and that's, that's one of the ways where, where that service intersects with the strategic plan from the council. Um, so just kind of, a, kind of an overview here. Um, the vision, the why, long-term and aspirational. So that's that described those things we talked about. What do we, what do we see as success looking like? Um, the kind of community we create. The strategy, the what, sort of long-term and guiding, the general direction for the implementation of core services. Some of that applies uh, to city staff a little more directly. One of the purposes of this document is so city staff have some sort of a guideline, so they're not always having to guess at what the council wants. And if they have a, you know, they can come to us and say, well, here, we did this because we thought it was based on this guideline. Um, and so that sort of helps that communication back and forth. Um, and then the action steps, the how, immediate and actionable highlights pressing high impact items that received, received some of those discretionary resources. For instance, where do we put the ARPA funds? How do we invest those in our community to get the, the best um, outcomes for our entire community? Um, you know, again, about Iowa City sort of setting the stage. One of the things uh, that, um, and this predates my time on the council, so I can't take credit for this because this is the direction we were already heading. When it came to things like the ARPA funds, we were looking at ways to help various segments of our community. If you look around the state, um, other, other areas were doing things like building a new children's detention center or a new jail, um, you know, things like that, um, that really were not exactly in the scope of what those ARPA funds were intended to help you know, people hurting from the pandemic. Um, instead, they were used in a variety of different ways. We really kept that focus. Um, and I think that's, that's just, I, I bring that up as an example of what those values look like in action. So we talk about wanting to do things like uh, fight inequity and to make our community uh, and our neighborhoods more resilient. Um, and, and I use those, those the, the many meetings we have had and in the uh, debates uh, and, and discussions we have had about how to spend that money, but those are all based on those sorts of values um, of our city. And again, started before I got on council and continues now that I'm on council. Um, and that's one of those things that I was actually really appreciated of, appreciative of as I was coming on to council that we already had a city that was working in those directions. So. I have talked for quite a while now. Um, I would be happy to go into more depth on any particular area, but I also want to be mindful of your time and the time of people uh, who are waiting to speak. And so I will pause um, and ask you if you have any questions of me, and I'll do my best to answer them. I have a question. What yeah. happens to previous strategic plans? 
once you pu publish a new one, for example, IC 2030, where does that stand now? Right, right. Um, so, uh, you know, like anything else, I think this is a, um, I'm going to flip ahead to the neighborhoods and vision just to have that up there. Um, I think one of the things about that is these are living documents. So we spend a lot of time to come up with something, but it's not like we're engraving them in stone. And so this actually was a question similar was asked by, by the other uh, the commission. Um, not only is it a living document, but we can go back to something. So as you know, the situation changes, right? So even since we created this and, and we approved it uh, by the end of last year, already some of the situation has changed in terms of some of the state laws have changed, right? Um, and so that will that will affect. So what happens is they're they're sort of the starting point for the new process. So things from the older strategic plans maybe get melded into this. An evaluation, like do we still want to keep those things? And so that was actually kind of the starting point. Um, I imagine in the future this will be the starting point for the next round of revisions. One of the things I asked specifically when we started this process, I want to say February or March of last year, because then I was just on the council a couple of months, was, so what do we do in two years when there are new people who come onto the council who also, you know, have probably, you know, did so because uh, they have ideas about the community? And, and the answer was, yeah, we update this, um, this document. So it's, it's one of those things that can be adaptable, but it also gives us, uh, you know, it's sort of like having a map that you draw, but then some of the streets get closed for, I don't know, reconstruction projects, as we are getting very familiar with here in Iowa City. So you redraw the map uh, or, or re redraw the route to the, uh, as things change. But you still know how you want to get to point A, from point A to point B. So. The IC 2030 plan is the comprehensive plan, though, and okay. this is the strategic oh, plan. Oh, I misunderstood. Yes. Well, oh, the so comp not. plan. Yes, that's another. So really there's a distinction between the two oh, plans. Oh, thank you for still, catching that. Yeah, that's all right. I, yeah. I notice here strategy number one says update the comp plan. So that's kind of what. Um, yes, yes. Um, is it okay if I dive into the comp plan just for a brief oh, touch on that? please do, because that's what impacts. Right, this so board. the strategic plan uh, then guides us for the comp plan revision. So um, I don't know how much, just kind of make sure everybody's up to speed. So we just approved also in this budget the hiring of a uh, consultant to facilitate the comprehensive plan uh, review, which will be a longer process, probably a couple of years before it start to finish. Um, as we take, I think it's been, oh, Jeff told me, and I don't remember, but I think it's been over a decade, um, maybe perhaps longer. So, um, but I mean, again, a document that's a living document because, as you know, we adjust that plan as things change, uh, but then has that sort of that sort of guideline for the entire city on how we want the growth to go. One of the things about that is then, as we take a look at how do we have our neighborhoods and housings, how do we look at things like uh, neighborhoods that are more mixed than the traditional you know, 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s sort of planning where you have a very homogenous kind of neighborhood with, with all the same kind of housing. Um, how do you do sort of more of a mixed uh, sort of approach, the form-based code, um, which is something that I anticipate we'll be trying to see, okay, how does this going to fit in um, in the next round of a comprehensive plan? So, uh, but yes, you're right. So, so different plans, thank you so much for catching that. Uh, but they do relate and it kind of make, I mean, I, I think the logic is set up your sort of strategic plan and then as we move into the comprehensive plan, that will uh, hopefully help guide us um, through those kinds of things as we take and make those like down to the fine granular detail, so. And I'll also just add, it's one of those things that kind of feed off of each other, too, because the comprehensive plan has a longer time vision than a strategic plan. So usually you're looking 20 plus years out for a comp plan, whereas strategic plan is very focused on what are our immediate actions that we want to do to try and reach our broader term vision. So they feed off of each other. Their time frame is a little different. Uh, that's kind of how it ends up working together. And you can kind of see from the vision here, like this idea of, um, each community member having easy access to everyday facilities, 15 minute walk or bike ride, uh, neighborhoods compact and socially diverse, variety of housing, um, permanent affordable housing choices are dispersed throughout the community. So you can kind of start to see the shape, right, of what we'd be looking for as we start to, to review that comprehensive plan. How do we adjust our zoning codes in ways that try to accomplish these goals? Um, and that's going to, again, probably look different for every section that we look at and why it'll be a longer process. But, um, you know, that's what we need to do in order to plan our community well. 
How are you planning on going about evaluating your success in reaching these goals? Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. I can't remember if that's actually a slide at the end. Let me... Okay, I don't think it's specifically a slide. So periodically, I guess it depends on the area. So periodically, we get a variety of reports on these various initiatives uh, from city, various city staff. So uh, whether it's our uh, community development folks coming forward and saying, here's where we have, you know, uh, if you go down and look through the more granular parts of the, uh, um, uh, the strategic plan where we say we'd like to see this happen and this happen and this happen, if it's in the area of community development, the community development, Tracy Heitschu or somebody will periodically come to council and say, we have met these goals, we have not been able to meet these goals, um, these specific things. Uh, if we're talking about climate change, same thing. We've given some directives uh, and say we've met some of these goals, we haven't met some of these goals. Uh, transportation, what's our ridership like? What's our availability? Have we been able to, you know, not only do are we looking at um, the fares, but also the hours of operation? And so some of these things may work together in tandem as ridership increases, as we get uh, more access to workforce. One of the, the challenges with the, uh, uh, the public transit right now is the uh, difficulties with hiring sufficient numbers of drivers in order to have all of the current routes uh, be sufficiently staffed. And that's something that uh, our, our, direct, our director of transportation has been working at. Uh, I believe has made some progress in that area, but that's something we have to be aware of, that you can't just like snap your fingers and have qualified people uh, there uh, at a moment's notice. It takes some time to build that up, and so. Um, but yes, so as these things trickle down to the, through the, from the council to the, to the city manager's office, down to the various departments, um, then as they accomplish some of these things, we hear reports back on, on how that's going, essentially. What if they don't accomplish some of these things? That's a great question. I think that depends on the accomplish the, the particular goal. Um, why? Is it because we as a city council haven't given them sufficient resources? Is it an external factor we didn't anticipate? Uh, for instance, if we, if our, one of our goals would have been increased ridership, if back in, let's say we had done this in 2019, if they, and then the pandemic hits in 2020 and they come to us in 2022 and say our ridership has dropped off, okay, well, we can see that that's an external factor, right? So. Um, you know, uh, but if it's a question of have we as a council given the sufficient resources, then that's on us to correct that problem. Or if that's not something we can do, figure out a different way to get to the same goal. Does that answer your question? I mean, it really depends on, this, uh, depends on the particular thing. I just want to make sure, I mean, there are a lot of goals in here that uh, there are some in particular that I'm very much interested in, and I would like to see them happen. Sure. And for, for example? I, and uh, Governor and Dodge and working with the state to turn oh. them into two-way streets again. Right. And there was no mention of Jefferson and uh, Market. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and these are things that, to a certain segment of society, well, for uh, Governor and uh, Dodge. Dodge, I mean, that's an important uh transportation thing for a lot of people, but there are a lot of people who live along those streets. And the, uh, the amount of traffic and the speed of traffic impact the people who live there, it, they impact the neighborhood, the, what it, the neighborhood is like. So I'd like to know that, you know, uh, it's not just on, on as a goal right now, and then it sort of slithers off into the sunset. And, and sure. there are a lot of these goals, and I would like to know that they are revisited periodically to see how, how, you are, how, how much progress you're making on these things. Thank you. I think I understand your question a little better now. I mean, that is what the document is for, is to hold us accountable. And if we as a council are letting things slide, um, or we are not holding our staff accountable, um, then the community says, hey, you had this, you put this down in paper. Where is this? And it's actually, and I actually forget, we did get an update. Oh, I can't remember now. I don't want to misspeak on those two different streets, the one ways that you had mentioned. So off the top of my head, I can't tell you, give you an exact answer, but we do peri periodically get updates. The last I knew with the Dodge, um, the, and some of this requires reaching out to like the DOT, so the, um, uh, the Dodge Street uh, one ways and stuff like that. That's not 
solely at the discretion of Iowa City. Um, I know with the market in Jefferson, that sort of started before my time, and it was something that, you know, I was just in downtown Cedar Rapids uh, here again recently, and was again reminded about how much easier it is to navigate without all the one ways that used to be there. So I, I think there's some some uh, desire to get that done, uh, but I think it's one of those things too that requires, as I recall, requires uh, some resources um, in order to change the signaling, change the painting and striping, and I don't remember the details, so I don't want to go too far down that path. But to the accountability portion, we should be holding each other accountable and can point to this, or we can be holding you know, the city staff accountable, or members of the public can be holding us accountable. And so rather than completely vague promises, things that are written down uh, would be part of that answer, so. Uh, the Burlington Street uh, item uh, was an item that was brought up in I went to a number of meetings in the 90s, and, <coughs> excuse me, and. It's okay. Yeah, me too. And there were a lot of people who were upset about the amount of traffic and the design of, the Bur of Burlington Street. It is now 2023, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we are still attempting to deal with that. So it's <coughs> one of the things that's on here, and I would like to, at some point in my lifetime, see that actually happen, and I'm sure. getting older. Yeah, no, good to know, and this is the kind of important feedback um, we as a council need to hear from <laughs> any member of our community. Um, again, specifically on the Burlington, I know that's another one that is considered a state route, and so there's a lot of dealing with the state DOT. Um, I do believe, too, one of the big projects that's on the horizon, and I can't tell you how far out on the horizon, is replacing that bridge. Um, that's something that, that, that will be coming up. Now, whether that be an opportunity to, you know, look at some of the options for, for Burlington Street, um, I'm not sure, but, um, but I do know that's coming up and that'll affect that corridor for a while as, as that goes on. I know coming up here, I don't know when it, if it's already started yet or not, but pretty soon we'll have that Gilbert Street Bridge is supposed to be done this summer. And so, you know, again, that'll be, traffic is not going to, but that, that's kind of always, when you have to maintain your infrastructure, that's gonna happen, so. But thank you, thank you for bringing that up. But as I said, I have lived here a long time and I have seen a lot of these plans and they're really exciting when they're first sure. put out. But if they are not, uh, if progress is not made on them, the citizens of Iowa City get to the point where that's they go, fair. words are great, but I want to see actions. Sure, that's fair. Do you have any questions? Okay, so I have another question. Because um, you talked about, you know, I mean, this is a visioning process and we do the best we can. Mm -hmm. And you talked about office space and how the use of office space has changed. Sure, as an example of changes as from the example. pandemic. So what, um, you know, the university announced in April that it's moving towards some aspects of a meta-university concept um, with interactive spaces in virtual reality for online classes that takes it a step, you know, way above Zoom. Okay, um, okay. I, I guess I missed that, but okay. It's right. Um, and uh, it's the first Big Ten university to make that announcement that they're going with this company to develop that to enhance their digital learning opportunities. They will provide a, a online, there's a tour that people can take um, and they hope to expand that. Uh, many universities ac across the country are moving somewhat rapidly in some cases to this kind of meta-university concept. Some of them are totally going to this concept. So um, students today still face the same challenges that I did 50 some odd years ago when, but my challenge was just coming from a town in, Bur in Burlington, Iowa mm -hmm. to big Iowa City. But I still faced, you know, tuition costs, housing costs, all of those things that um, impacted my decision on where sure. I could go and at what point in my education I could do that. Um, 
the meta university concept is going to erase some of those barriers, that physical location of having to be on a campus real time. Um, the universities potentially could look at expanding their outreach. Uh, for example, the University of Iowa is famous for its writing program. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but again, some students may be uh, limited because they may be living in uh, Scotland or somewhere else and they can't actually physically relocate here. But they could take, uh, become a virtual reality student in this meta-university concept. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So as a professor, okay. as, as a member of the city council, I'm just wondering if um, the city has begun to look at those impacts that could happen in Iowa City, especially with the need for actual on-campus student housing or even within Iowa City housing for people as these universities, if the vision holds up, transition to a virtual reality experience. Interesting. I hadn't heard of that. Uh, Meta, you mean capital M, right, with a Facebook company, the parent company they're, of Facebook? Yeah. They're associated with that, but this company is out of, De Mo of Davenport. Okay. He's a former state senator. Um, yeah, like I said, that's, I had missed this story, so I, I, I won't be I'd able be to speak. I'd be happy to send in, you some information. Yeah, please. I'll probably Google it later. Um, but you can send me something, too. That's, that's interesting. Sure. I think what you said before, how this vision holds out, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, certainly we have a lot of pressure on our housing, and, uh, um, you know, uh, housing for our students um, is a, that's a big pressure on our entire housing market. Um, I do you think, I mean, I guess we'll, we'll wait and see. Like I said, it's pretty brand new, so we'll see how that works out. Um, I don't really have an intelligent guess on how that's going to work out. Um, you know, I, I know that uh, virtual reality is fun for video games and has some training applications. Not sure how uh, the classroom experience, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I can't imagine any place is going to go all in for that until they have a little more testing. So I imagine any big changes might be a little ways down the road. But it'll be interesting to see, like, like how that, uh, you know, how that may change the game for higher education. But well, you know how fast technology changes, um, AI uses, sure. all of those things. Well, that's um, a whole other issue. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, it, you know, so I just, I just would encourage city staff, um, planning staff, and city council to at least start to put this on your radar hmm, as you, as, I mean, you're, you know, we're not planning for 50 years in the future, but 50 years ago, I was a young student that came here. And so, like Nancy, I've seen a lot of changes. Sure, yeah. Um, the student housing options for me were not anything like are being developed today uh, with swimming pools and spas and uh, exercise rooms and uh, even Canvas came into being when I was a student here. So, but I think um, it would be well worth your time to check into it. Uh, at least get it on your radar and how that will impact yeah. housing needs for Iowa City. Yeah, could certainly have, a, have an impact on housing needs. Well, I guess we'll kind of wait and see how it pans out. Um, something brand new, you never know. So, interesting. Yeah, thank you for bringing that to my attention. Also, professionally, that'll be interesting to, that'll be interesting to see how that goes. So, especially after <coughs> teaching, teaching a whole year on Zoom, right. not that long ago. Any other questions? Oh, thank you. Thank you all for having me here. Thank you for this discussion. I hope this was helpful information for you. And I just want to say again, thank you um, uh, to all of you for your service to the community. Uh, it is often invisible to the vast majority of people. Uh, but those of us who see you, see you well and appreciate the work that you do. And so with that, I will go ahead and bid you farewell. I'm off to watch this thing at City High that my daughter's in uh, here shortly. And so I uh, have a good rest of your meeting. And uh, thank you so much for being uh, waiting so patiently. So, all right, thank you. Thank you.
I will open the public hearing for EX C23-0004, an application submitted by Jennifer Colville and Miles Pufal, Porch Light Literary Center, requesting special exceptions to allow a religious private group assembly use in a neighborhood stabilization residential RNS 12 zone and to reduce the setback requirements at 1019 East Washington Street. Will the city uh, planner please give the staff report? Yes, thank you. Kirk Lehman, associate planner. Um, I'm actually going to close that laptop quick just because we won't need it and then I'll be right back. Okay. So uh, we are discussing the, probably mostly discuss it as the Porchlight Literary Center application or the Porchlight Center, uh, which is requesting a special exception to be a private group assembly use. So there's no religious aspect to it uh, in a neighborhood stabilization zone. Uh, it, in terms of where this is occurring, it's occurring in the College Hill neighborhood. So it's a residential area east of downtown. Uh, the building that they're looking at, 1019 uh, East Washington Street, uh, was a single family home that was converted into four one bedroom apartments. So there's two on the first floor and then there's two on the second floor and the proposed conversion to this group assembly use would be for those two uh, that are on the first floor. In terms of surrounding uses, it, it's a residential area, like I said. Uh, this property and the properties to the east and the west are all zoned neighborhood stabilization uh, residential uh, in the single family zone, so RNS 12. Uh, they also do have a conservation district overlay as part of the College Hill Conservation District. Um, so uh, th it is a little different to the north and the south. Both of those have the same base zone of RS8 or medium density single family residential. Uh, the property to the north is also in that OCD zone. Uh, the property to the south is actually in uh, a historic district overlay, so it's kind of a, a step up in terms of the uh, historical integrity of that portion of the neighborhood um, in terms of uses and, and uh, of buildings specifically. So in terms of, of the property, again, this conversion's been around for a long time, at least since the 1970s at some point. Um, the actual neighborhood stabilization zone was applied in 2000, and the purpose of that was to try and stabilize existing residential neighborhoods by preserving its predominantly single-family residential character. Um, there are provisions in this zone uh, that prevent the conversion or redevelopment of single-family uses to multifamily uses, but those that already existed at the time it was applied uh, are allowed to continue as a conforming use. Um, so that includes the subject property. Uh, as far as that conservation district overlay, that was applied in 2003 as a contributing structure in the College Hill Conservation District, like I mentioned. Uh, the OCD overlay zone means that uh, if there are exterior changes to the property uh, that, that require a regulated permit, then that would have to go through a historic review, which goes before the Historic Preservation Commission, typically. In some cases, smaller ones might, might go to Historic <laughs> Preservation staff. Uh, but as part of this application, there is no proposed exterior changes. Uh, this is more just some background for you to understand kind of the, the context of everything. Um, in terms of the actual changes that are being proposed, it is strictly a change of use from uh, those two multifamily uses on the ground floor to this private group assembly use. So those, that's really what we're looking at for tonight's application. So in terms of the applicants, they are both members of the ownership entity, it's owned by an LLC, and then they also help to incorporate that uh, nonprofit Porchlight Literary Center uh, that would occupy that first floor use. Uh, they actually purchased the property in 2021 uh, with a goal of using that ground floor as meeting space for literary events uh, and facilities uh, for a nonprofit use, um, which is classified in the zoning code as a private group assembly use, uh, but private group assembly uses do require a special exception uh, in an RNS 12 zone. Uh, in terms of those two dwelling units on the ground floor, once they are converted to private group assembly use, uh, they couldn't be converted back into a multifamily use. Uh, but the multifamily use on the second story, 
Uh, those are also affiliated with this nonprofit, uh, but they are multifamily uses. They're allowed to continue as multifamily uses, and they do not have to be affiliated with that nonprofit. So in the application, they mentioned using them as, as artist residencies, for example. Uh, that does not have to be the case uh, because those multifamily uses are allowed to continue as they were uh, prior to the zoning. Uh, in addition to that special exception for the conversion of the use, uh, we are also looking at a special exception to reduce uh, enhanced side and rear setback standards that apply to uh, private group assembly uses. Uh, there is a provision within those specific criteria that I'll get to that, that lets the board also adjust those setbacks standards at the same time. Um, but, but as part of this, uh, you know, the applicant's been working with us to try and bring this property in conformance with the zoning code. Uh, and uh, they've been great working to work with. And on April 30th, they did also hold a voluntary good neighbor meeting. So they had an opportunity to speak with the neighbors and, and those materials are included in your packet. In terms of the, the application materials submitted, here you can see just a closer aerial. Uh, one thing I do wanna point out is you can see the parking in the rear off of an alley. The, the property is set back unusually far. Uh, because it is a historic property built around 1893. Um, and again, we're just replacing the use, so the parking would remain the same. The, the rest of the site characteristics would also remain the same. And then in terms of the actual site plan itself, um, with setbacks, it's about 74 feet from the front lot line. It's about 20 feet from the east lot line, 15 from the west, uh, and then just over 30 feet from the south as well. So here you can see some pictures of the property that kind of put that into perspective for you. Uh, both of them are looking south at the, the building itself. Um, the lower left picture is, is looking at the building more closely. You can see those historic details still maintained on the property. And then the upper right one shows what it looks like from the street. So you can see that there's quite a bit of slope there and it's set back pretty far along with the adjacent properties. Uh, I did also just want to show you the rear of the property. So the upper right is looking to the northeast where you can see the parking area that currently exists, uh, which includes that carriage house as well. Um, and then in the lower left, you can see each side uh, of the subject property as well, where you can see that the setbacks are a bit further than typical. There's quite a bit uh, of uh, trees, mature trees as well that are part of that property. So tonight, the role of the board is to approve, approve with conditions or deny the application. Uh, and to approve, it must meet all specific and general approval criteria. So those specific standards are pertaining to the waiver requested, uh, that being, again, a group assembly use in an RS-12 zone, in addition to those setback reductions, and then also the general standards that do apply to all special exceptions. So th the standards for group assembly uses uh, are located at 144B4017. Uh, and there are several of them that, that I will go through as part of my presentation. Uh, the first is the enhanced setback standards that I mentioned, um, and those would be a front setback of 20 feet, side setbacks of 20 feet, and a rear setback uh, of 50 feet, but there is an opportunity for the board to adjust these standards. Uh, in terms of whether or not the building meets it, uh, it is an existing building. It's set back further than normal from the north lot line, so it's over 70 feet. Uh, and the side lot line to the east is more than 20 feet, so those two sides are met. Uh, but the side lot line to the west and the south side lot line to the south do not meet it. Uh, it is less than 20 feet to the west, it's only 15 feet, and to the south it's around 30 feet. Uh, but because it is an existing building, the applicant has requested uh, setback reductions for the, the side and rear setbacks. And I'll discuss those findings and the specific standards regarding those later. The next set of standards is whether or not it is uh, designated to be compatible with or designed to be compatible with adjacent uses. This is considering lots of different factors, including things like traffic, including things like noise. Uh, and it does, the criteria itself does remind you that um, the board may uh, impose additional conditions. Of course, you can do that for, for every uh, special exception. So with regards to whether or not it's adjacent or designed to be compatible with adjacent uses. Um, the use itself that's proposed is a nonprofit literary center. It would have space access for its members to write and host <laughs> workshops, sessions, or readings. Uh, and because it is a private group assembly use, uh, it is primarily intended for use by its membership. Uh, it does typically restrict access to the public and it can't be rented for commercial office uses or for events held by the general public. 
Uh, the use is an existing home that was built in 1893. Uh, if there are exterior alterations in the future because it's in an OCD zone, that would have to go before historic review. <laughs> but generally, those physical characteristics of the existing historic building, things like scale, setbacks, landscaping, paving, they are compatible with residential uses. They've been existing for a long time. Uh, and none of those uh, exterior changes are proposed as part of this application. Uh, in terms of the use, it would also replace those uh, dwelling units on the ground floor, as I mentioned. Uh, and once those are converted to this use, they would not be able to be converted back into multifamily uses. Uh, in terms of the actual use of the space for some of its larger events, not just for those uh, individual space for, for members, um, the applicant has indicated that the number of persons per workshop is restricted to 12, with occasional readings of up to 30 people utilizing both indoor and outdoor space. I believe in the packet it, there's an example uh, of a photo of what it looks like when, when there's folks on the, that uh, large lawn in the front with people reading from the porch, for example. Uh, however, with group assembly uses, um, the way that we calculate parking standards for those is based on the largest room within the space. Uh, and so within this building, the largest room is, I believe uh, it was referred to as the parlor in the application. Uh, that does have an occupancy of 25 people. Uh, so to ensure that traffic and parking remain consistent with the building occupancy, staff does recommend a condition that if there is an event that just uses that indoor space, it should be limited to no more than 25 people, which is consistent with that parking standard uh, on the site. Uh, so that is just a, a condition that staff recommends uh, as approval. But with that condition, staff does believe that this criteria is met. Moving on to uh, the next standard is related to large parking lots can seriously erode single family character of zones. So parking above the minimum should be carefully reviewed. Uh, the proposed use does require a minimum of six parking spaces. Uh, four of those are required by the private group assembly use, with two of them required for the one-bedroom apartments uh, on the upper story. The proper, property does contain seven <laughs> existing off-street parking spaces, uh, access from the alley. Six of those are the surface spaces accessed directly from the alley. The seventh is theoretically in the carriage house. I don't believe that it's used for parking currently, uh, but all of those spaces are existing legal non-conforming spaces that would count towards that parking standard. Um, so there, are, there is no proposed expansion in terms of parking uh, with, with what's being proposed. There is also on-street parking available on one side of East Washington Street to the north, uh, and then on one side of Summit Street, which is uh, another nearby street. Uh, but with, with using the existing parking, staff does believe that this criteria is met. <coughs> Uh, the, the next one is related to, again, adverse effects on the livability of nearby residential uses with, with considering a few different uh, criteria or things that might impact it, like glare, late night operations. Uh, the building is 15 feet from neighboring residential uses. Staff does believe that that provides adequate separation to prevent most uh, or to mitigate most adverse effects. Uh, and it is zoned RNS 12, so as a residential residential zone, it has to comply with some enhanced noise standards that are part of the code, uh, which generally pr prohibits noise across property lines be between <laughs> 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. Um, that being said, staff does have a few conditions that we would recommend uh, to help mitigate some noise and late night impacts, which are considered as part of this. So one is that there be no outdoor events that occur between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., so mirroring those noise uh, restrictions. Uh, and then also that amplified sound not be allowed outside. So that would be things like uh, you can't use a mic on the property as a residential area. You would have to use a <laughs> natural volume to be able to, uh, to project if you're doing a reading on the porch, for example. In addition, with regards to glare, this property is subject to enhanced outdoor light standards uh, that are part of the zoning code. So those do help mitigate, mitigate glare for, from lights. Uh, again, if there is exterior changes, those would have to go through a site plan review because uh, this would not be considered a single family property. Um, but there are no changes as part of this. Uh, in terms of odors and litter, uh, due to the relatively limited extent of the use, staff doesn't anticipate any, uh, any issues beyond what would be expected with the existing uses that were on the site. So staff doesn't believe that that's 
uh, much of an issue, but with those conditions that we recommended with regards to uh, late night operations in amplified sound, staff does find that this criteria is met. Uh, this one just allows, if it's an existing use, it can get a minor mod instead of a special exception to expand within a certain threshold. Uh, it's a new use, and so a special exception is required. And then finally, if it's in a residential zone or the central planning district, it has to comply with multifamily site development standards. Uh, this one is in a residential zone in the central planning district, so it does has to comply. Um, and there, it does meet most standards with the existing building, but it doesn't meet all standards. So specifically, the standards that it doesn't meet are related to service parking and detached garages. It also doesn't meet standards regarding building materials. Um, those are things like setbacks between parking areas and adjacent properties, uh, screening between parking areas, uh, screening between uh, parking areas and ground floor windows on the subject property. Uh, there's, for the, that's with regards to the parking area, with regards to multifamily site development standards and building materials. Uh, it doesn't meet window and door trim requirements because uh, the trim in some cases are two inches rather than three inches. Uh, it doesn't have a durable base that's two feet along the entire property because the <coughs> foundation is on a sloping, sl sloping site, so it's less than that in most locations. Um, however, all of these non-compliant features are part of a legal non-conforming, or they are legal non-conforming elements. Uh, most of them are considered development features. Some are consider considered structural features. Um, so as long as that degree of non-conformity is not increased, uh, they are allowed to continue as they are. Um, and with no changes to the site or structure being proposed, none of those are being uh, extended. Uh, and if there are exterior changes, that's subject to historic review as well because of that o uh, OCD zone. So with these findings, staff does believe that this criteria is met. Which brings us to the reduction of principal setback requirements at 14.2 A4B 5B. So this has its own set of specific standards. Uh, first, that it's particular to the property in question. Uh, again, there are existing setbacks that are less than those enhanced standards required for group assembly use, but they are well over the minimum for most uses within the zone. Um, so with it being an existing building, with <coughs> setbacks that were built prior to the zone, uh, staff does believe that this is a peculiar situation for this property. <coughs> Second is that there's practical difficulty complying with the setback requirements. Uh, it is an existing building. The only way to comply would be to chop off portions of the building or to move the building itself. Um, staff does believe that that's, this constitutes a practical difficulty. Uh, third is that it won't be contrary to the purpose of the setback regulations. So the minimum setback standards themselves have several uh, purposes. That includes maintaining light air separation for fire protection and access for firefighting. It includes privacy between dwellings, reflecting the general building scale placement of structures in the neighborhood, a reasonable physical relationship between buildings and residences, and then finally flexibility to a site uh, with regards to, to how it works with buildings in its vicinity. So again, existing buildings set back further than typical uses. Exterior changes are subject to historic review. Um, staff does believe that, uh, as discussed, uh, reducing the side setbacks and the rear setbacks would continue to meet these, uh, the, these intent, the intent of the code. Fourth is that any negative effects are mitigated to the extra extent practical. Uh, it's an existing building. Staff doesn't believe that uh, any mitigation is required. And then fifth, that it's no closer than three feet to a property line, and it's not. So finally, uh, we'll cover the, the general criteria that apply to all special uh, exceptions that are found at 144B3. The first is related to public health, safety, comfort, and general welfare. So to reiterate, it's an existing converted single family home. The building is and site are compatible with existing uses and exterior changes are proposed, but if they are in the future, it has historic review. Uh, the use itself would be used for members to write, host workshops or work sessions and readings. Uh, and staff does believe that because it's that private group assembly use that mitigates uh, some health and safety impacts, uh, specifically because it's intended for use by its members, access to the general public is, is generally prohibited or typically restricted, 
uh, and it can't be used for those commercial office uses or for events held by the public. Um, in terms of if there are future changes, life and safety standards are typically reviews as part of that process. I didn't mention this because the, the rental units aren't part of this application, but it also has to go under things like, you know, your standard rental permit review, um, things like that. Um, and on top of that, the use would provide a unique amenity for the neighborhood and for the community, which staff believes improves general welfare. So based on these findings, staff believes that this criterion is met. Second is it doesn't negatively impact surrounding properties, essentially, or impact property values. Uh, it is compatible with surrounding uses, no exterior changes. Uh, it does maintain that historic appearance of the property, uh, which staff believes uh, enhances property values and the enjoyment of neighboring property owners. Uh, and with conditions as recommended, staff believes that that will help uh, mitigate any potential negative effects on surrounding properties. So with, with those conditions, staff believes that this is met. Third is that it won't impede uh, development of surrounding properties. Uh, it's a fully developed area and it's an existing building that's set back from adjacent properties more than most uses within the zone. Um, and with conditions as recommended, staff doesn't believe that, that there would be uh, impacts on surrounding properties. Fourth is that it has adequate facilities and services, and it's an existing building that has all those services, so staff believes that this is met. Fifth is regarding ingress or egress to minimize traffic congestion at public streets. So in terms of the access for the property, there are kind of two access points. One is along East Washington Street, if you're coming from that street and walking up. Uh, the other is from the rear alley, which exits onto South Summit Street or Muscatine Avenue. Um, that's where you have access to the parking area. Um, there are no changes being proposed to the street, alley, or sidewalks, and it is in a pedestrian-oriented neighborhood uh, near downtown. It's easy to bike to. It's less than 300 feet from a bus line, so it does have pretty good access from non-vehicular means. Uh, and again, the applicant has indicated that events will be limited in terms of the number of people that can attend, and with conditions as recommended, uh, it would be also limited for indoor exclusive events to 25 attendees. So all of these things do help mitigate some of those traffic impacts that are expected. And um, with those conditions, staff believes that this criteria is met. Uh, but staff does recommend an additional condition with regards to bicycle parking, which uh, I would like to, to mention as well. So in this case, it's an existing use uh, it doesn't comply with, with our minimum bicycle parking requirements. Um, so that is something that wouldn't be required to be added unless the use was, extend, was expanded. But in the good neighbor meeting, someone mentioned it would be great to have some bike racks. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense in terms of mitigating those traffic impacts as a bikeable area. So staff does also recommend a condition uh, that the subject property be brought into compliance with those minimum bicycle parking standards. Uh, that would require adding four bicycle parking spaces, and those standards would have to comply with, with our zoning code standards as it gets added to the property. So with that condition, on top of the conditions regarded to occupancy, staff finds that this criteria is met. Uh, the sixth criteria is just about meets all other standards. So I've talked a lot about how there are some existing conditions on the property that don't meet our standards, but otherwise it generally meets our standards. Um, and it would be brought into greater compliance with our standards with the proposed condition about adding minimum bicycle parking or four bicycle parking spaces. Uh, again, any future changes, if there's expansions, those are typically the things that, that require compliance with various site elements. Uh, the structure is allowed to basically continue as it is uh, as long as the use within it isn't, isn't expanded or the building isn't expanded. Um, so if there are future changes, that's typically when staff would review uh, if any of these non-conforming elements needs to be brought into compliance. Um, but with, with the conditions recommended, it is being brought into greater compliance uh, with our zoning code, and staff does believe that this criteria is met. And then finally, compliance with the comprehensive plan. So the future land use map of the comprehensive plan shows it as two to eight dwelling units per acre. The central district plan shows it as single family residential stabilization, which as I mentioned, uh, is to prevent further conversion of single family residences to multifamily. There are also some other goals that are re related to arts and culture uses. Um, with the comprehensive plan, it supports new arts and culture venues and 
uh, supports enhancing access by supporting nonprofits engaged in art programming. With regards to the central district plan, uh, it wants to make it an attractive place to live by supporting efforts of community organizations to create a sense of identity and neighborhood pride through art. Uh, and as I mentioned, this would convert two multifamily uses into a uh, literary nonprofit. So it does support several of those goals. Uh, and it is a use that is uh, compatible with surrounding neighborhood residential uses. So staff does believe that this meets uh, the, the intent of the comprehensive plan. I did also want to touch on the good neighbor meeting and public comments as well. Uh, I already mentioned that bicycle parking came up as part of that. Some other things that were mentioned were things like a handicap access can be difficult from the front because of that change uh, in elevation on the front property line. Uh, but it was noted that the back is, is more accessible. Um, and then also that parking could be a challenge for the site. Um, they said that it's been better lately, but that in the past, depending on who's living where and how many cars they have, you know, that can be a challenge because there is only parking on one side of the street. Uh, we did also receive three comments from neighbors in support uh, of the use. Um, one of those was submitted as part of the packet. Two of them uh, were submitted late, so they were forwarded to the board, and they're also included at your seats. So I did just want to mention those as well. Uh, based on these findings and the comments, the staff does want to recommend approval of EXC 23004 uh, to allow a religious private group assembly use in an RNS 12 zone and also to allow side setback reductions of 15 feet and a rear setback reduction to 30 feet for the property at 1019 East Washington Avenue, subject to four conditions. So I've discussed those already, but limiting the amount of persons who can attend indoor events to 25 uh, is one that staff would recommend. Second is no outdoor events between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. A third is no amplified sound outdoors. And then fourth is that within six months of the date of a decision by the board, um, that four bicycle parking spaces be installed on the subject property with the ability of the board to, to extend that deadline. And staff chose six months because that's typically how long uh, a use that hasn't been established yet would have to establish. Um, so staff just mirrored that language in terms of the timeline about what's appropriate for, for someone to, to try and get these things done. So with that, uh, are there any questions from the board for staff? That concludes my presentation. Yeah, you picked the hours of 10 and 6 for no noise. Is that just the typical thing for all neighborhoods? So that's the, the time at which you're not supposed to have noise cross property lines essentially within a residential neighborhood. There are some exceptions to that depending like I think construction can get exceptions and things like that. Um, but because it's a set standard that we use in terms of this is the period that we want to designate as our quiet, citywide quiet period for lack of a better term, the staff felt that the, that time frame was appropriate for, for no outdoor events. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like some more information about the bike rack. Sure. Okay. Uh, if one is installed, it, does it need to be on concrete or, you know, what are the physical uh, requirements for a bike rack? Sure. So there's a set of criteria in our off-street parking and loading standards as to how those need to be constructed. Excuse me. And I can tell you in two seconds. So... There, there are minimum sizes for bicycle parking spaces is one of them. Second is that they have to be constructed of concrete uh, or some sort of manufactured paving material. Uh, there is an opportunity where the building official may permit the use of rock or gravel for bicycle parking if edging material is used so that the bicycle parking area is clearly demarcated. Um, they also have to be designed to support the bicycle by its frame. They have to be set back a certain distance from the edge of the pavement or the edge of that um, parking area. Uh, and they have to be in a clearly designated safe, visible, and convenient location uh, and located such as that they do not impede pedestrian or vehicular traffic. So there is an opportunity for them within uh, the front setbacks or side setbacks in the zone uh, if it results in a parking area, including the bicycle parking area that's no more than 25% of the required setback area uh, being paved. 
So in this case, that existing rear alley, the rear parking area is one of the other ways that it doesn't comply with existing standards is it's gravel. It's an existing area, so that we're not requiring that they, they pave that area. So it would likely be appropriate for gravel for a bicycle parking in this area with those, uh, with those edging materials. But all of that would be determined once they uh, submitted for, for their bicycle parking uh, in, to the city, or depending on how they were installing it, may require a building permit, may not. So would they have to um, adhere to setback standards from the property lines and? Yeah, so they would have to adhere to all standards in the zoning code. So they would have to adhere to setback standards. Um, in this case, it does allow it to be somewhat within that setback area for bicycle parking, as long as it's less than a certain percentage of it. Um, otherwise, it has to comply because it's a new thing that's being established on the property. So given the uh, layout of the property, how difficult would it be to have to initiate or have this put in? It's probably a good a question for the applicant. Yeah. Is that for, okay. I mean, we've discussed it with the applicant, and they are comfortable installing bike racks as part of the. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Um, Kirk, help me uh, understand a couple of things here. On page four, I want to make sure that it says, because this is a single family residential zone, dwelling units converted into the proposed use would not be able to become dwelling units again. So if this property is sold in the future, um, the new owner would not be allowed to have those downstairs units or how would that process? That is correct. So the upstairs units would still be able to be rented to whoever. Mm -hmm. The downstairs units as, it's, as a converted use uh, would be allowed as a private group assembly use or it would have to be converted to a different use that's allowed within the zone. Okay, but could a new owner come back and s try to get an exception to reinstall the dwelling units? So the dwelling units... Are, are they gone permanently? They would be gone permanently. Okay. Um, and here's the thing that confuses me the most, and, uh, just a little bit below that. You're basing this standard of 25 people at an event based upon the internal space of the parlor. Um, but they have outdoor events as well. So by default, are you also restricting any outdoor event, combination of front porch, front yard, or front yard only, to 25 as well? So we did not, because when you have an outdoor event, you would expect some pass-by traffic to join it, or that was my expectation as I wrote my condition. And so it would be hard to limit an outdoor event compared to an indoor event. So, it, so for example, if you're hold, holding a poetry reading on a porch, mm -hmm. you're going to have people come. You might have other people that weren't, I mean, you're not going to like strictly invite the people or regulate the people who are walking by, may stop to listen for a bit and keep walking. And so it seemed appropriate to limit that to the indoor events uh, and the outdoor events might have some pass by traffic that is added as well. See, that seems contradictory to me. You, you're saying the standard is set on an indoor standard. Correct. So you limit the number of people that the house can accommodate based upon traffic concerns. But you have no concern about a larger event outdoors, assuming there's not going to be any additional traffic problems created by a larger event outdoors? So there could be additional traffic generated. Staff didn't believe that that was an issue and didn't feel like we needed to incorporate that in our recommended condition. But as the board, you are able to, if that's a concern of yours, you would be able to just say 25 occupants, period, and then they would have to more strictly regulate those outdoor events as well as indoor events. Okay, but so it, it is, unless it was spelled out in this recommendation, the recommendation they as could have any number of people for, for an outdoor event. Yeah, would not limit outdoor events. Correct. What would limit the outdoor event is our general nuisance yeah. provisions. You know, someone could call up and say, 
um, they're disturbing the peace. I can't oh, go to I, bed. You know, I mean, so there are still some safeguards about. Right. Um, but with I regards to that. parking concerns, it, it could be a parking concern. Okay, I understand all that. And yeah. I'm just, it just seems inconsistent to ignore the possibility of a larger attendance. My personal preference would be to increase the allowable number indoors. But I Is don't know. Is there if some a uh, fire code? that might also be applicable? Or? So the parking standard is based on the largest room. So there's a higher occupancy for the total space compared to just the largest room within the space. So presumably you could increase it and it wouldn't be a fire issue, I don't believe. Um, that being said, they would have to do their due diligence on fire code standards anyway. Um, this is. The, the condition as recommended was strictly based on that largest space. And you can think of it in terms of re religious group assembly uses are the same use. So for example, if you have a, a worship hall, you know that's what you're gonna base the parking off of, not off of the entire space of a church. So in this case, you're looking at the largest room, that's where you're gonna have the most people gathering, um, presumably for a single event. Uh, so that's what the parking's based off of. Okay, it just seems odd that you're using one a standard to restrict indoor parking, but ignoring the standard, uh, uh, indoor uh, numbers, but ignoring the standard for outdoor numbers. Yeah, s staff wasn't concerned for outdoor events. Okay. As much as indoor events. Okay. But, okay. Um, and, and, and Nancy asked about the, the times 10 to 6, which is pretty standard language throughout the code. Roughly, yeah. Okay. Um, and is it, when you talk about no outdoor um, sound amplification, uh, we talked about the times 10 to 6. I assume that that literally means never any outdoor sound amplification. Okay. For this use. I'm sorry? F for this use, yes, for that is use. correct. Okay. Okay, that's fine, thank you. Have no, I have no questions. I have some for the uh, one for the applicant, but so I'm not sure to ask you or to ask the applicant. Okay, but this is supposedly a nonprofit. It is a group uh, that is uh, asking for this, and it's for their group. So if people, so if they're having an outdoor event, if they're having a poetry reading on the porch and other people from the sidewalk or the street gather, does that change? Uh, I mean, then you're, you're dealing with the group versus the public. And sure. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I yeah, so, so the, the way that it's classified is it is typically restricted to the public. So if this became a, a situation where, you know, every day from eight to five, the public was coming in, that would no longer meet this use classification. It would become a different use. It would become a zoning code violation. However, as long as it was primarily intended for the membership of the group, those who come there to write and read and, you know, host their workshops, then that would be just fine, as long as it's typically restricted to the public. So the applicant, the group, could not invite the public to a reading. Yeah, they could do that if they wanted to. Yeah, I think there's a distinction between invitees, you know, just the general public. Right. You know, it's open for the public to come, like New Pi or, or City Hall. Um, you know, there's less e you know, people who are subject to a lease. There's different sort of categories of people who are allowed to be on the property. And I think as long as it's an invitee, you know, someone who is there at the um, request of the the organization that would be allowed. So the public is in a sense not restricted because they could be invited in. As long as they're invited in. Okay. Right. And then once they're invited in, you could have any number of people show up. Well, for the outdoor events. For the, the outdoor indoor events. indoor is like the 25, right? Okay. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the staff? Okay. Would the applicant like to step up and give her testimony and explain her 
Sure. Hi, everybody. And will you please sign in oh, with your yeah. name and your address? Okay, so um, so I've prepared a, this statement, and I can, I guess, address your questions af afterwards, um, just to give you kind of a little bit of, of, of history of the organizations that that are how how Portlet came to be, um, and the organizations that are a part of it. So, just you know, first of all, thank you for considering our request to be zoned as private group assembly. Um, at, this application, through this application pro process, I've learned quite a lot. Um, it's been a great opportunity to, to dive into Iowa City's comprehensive 2030 plan for development, um, as well as an opportunity to meet more of my neighbors, um, find out how we can provide our services while maintaining good relationships and fostering new ones. Um, and you know, we, we, do, we plan to follow all the stipulations put forth by the city planning staff regarding timing and noise reduction, um, as well as to install a bike rack. Um, yeah, so um, two of Porchlight's programs, uh, Prompt Press and the Free Generative Writing Workshop, have existed in the community for uh, 10 or more years. Uh, so through those programs, I gained entrance into the Iowa City Downtown Arts Alliance, uh, where Porchlight's goals and missions grew out of discussions about how to make Iowa City the greatest small city for the arts, or how to, how to preserve, preserve that um, or, or get there. Um, so to achieve a vibrant, inclusive city of the arts, it became clear we needed to work toward one, uh, providing affordable housing for artists, two, providing excellence in artistic culture and programming um, outside of the university, Okay, we definitely have it inside. <laughs> um, and three, creating programs wherein the arts can be integrated into social services um, and the overall health and well-being of, of the community. So um, those, are, those are three things that Porchlight, though small, um, we've been in operation for almost two years. I mean, we're hitting those goals. Um, and then with this new designation, we just hope to continue on our path with the added, um, added support of, of the city and, and our neighbors. Yeah, so. Questions? <laughs> yes, questions? Um, how do you define membership? I mean, how is it organized, restricted, defined? How many members do you have? Yeah, so um, we are, we're switching, in the process of switching to a, a co-op model, and um, we're basing that on the Iowa, Iowa City Press co-op. I don't know if you guys are familiar with, it's a part of a public space one, um, and they've done a, a really, a really fabulous job of creating a, a community there where the, the, the members um, really sort of build the, pro, they build the programming. Um, and yeah, so we're looking at, oh gosh, I can imagine, I don't know if I could organize more than 25 members. I mean, I won't, probably won't be organizing once they're members. They're, that there will, be, there will be committees and they'll be organizing themselves, I think. Um, but um, yeah, so so we're looking at, we have, oh gosh, I think we have about 12 members right now. Um, we have many more people who've come to our events because we partner with a lot of, uh, um, of different organ arts organizations within the, the community, because um, I'm guessing you're just you're wondering what kind of crowds mm -hmm. we draw. Um, so I think that the biggest the biggest event that we've had, um, gosh, well, it might have been last summer, and there 
our images of this. I think 30, we haven't gone over 30 people. And that feels, that feels okay for, for the space. It feels. That was um, indoors though. What's In, that? Indoors. Um, so that has, that was indoors and outdoors. So what we do is we open up the two doors of the salon area and they both go out onto the porch. So it was people mingling on the porch and, and indoors. Um, yeah. See, I, my concern is not with you all so much. I mean, I, I just find this, the, re, the rationale for restricting your events to be uh, contradictory. Um, but the program itself is terrific. And so when you're using space beyond the parlor space is what I'm hearing, right? Which include the porch or some other room. You have a lot more room than just for 25. Yeah, we've had about, I mean, I think that, I mean, we could, we could definitely if it, uh, so there was a reading um, that the, I'm trying to remember, um, the young, so, so the Young Writers Program, um, Stephen Lovely at the university does it, and we partnered, we partnered with him, and he held his end of, of the semester reading there, and a students read from up on the porch, um, and everyone sat on the grass, um, and that was about, that was about 30. And so, that did not require microphones or anything like that? Um, well, we did use a microphone then, um, and you know I think that without the microphone, it would have been harder to he harder to hear them. But we can. I mean, we're also we're very happy to have readings up on the porch um, and not not use the. I think using the porch as a kind of like the the pedestal. Um, it it. It, it was fun, but not necessary for the kinds of crowds that, that we'll draw. Um, so our first reading, we had um, Melissa Phoebos from, from the university come, and she was in kind of the corner of the porch, the crook of the porch, with people in, on both of the porch wings sitting, and there were about 25 people there. And if you're on the porch, you can project without a microphone. So. So we're okay with, with that, without using the microphone. Okay, I, I would like to give you a lot more flexibility as to the number of people oh, involved. Yeah. But I have zero tolerance for amplified sound that carries outdoors. Uh, and that goes back 40 years. Oh yeah. <laughs> the reason this town had a noise ordinance is because of me, a long time ago. Uh, so if you can use the space with an increased crowd over 25, I don't have any problem with that, but I just want to make sure that the, the sound is not an issue. Um, so is there anything in the staff, you, you've agreed to all these recommendations that the staff has made? Yeah. Okay, no we problems do. with the bikes or anything else. Uh, you could live with the 25 as a restriction on the indoor events, <laughs> even though you're using more space than just what the 25 is based on. Well, so I was, I, I did have a question about that. So. Um, so if it is a, a an event where uh, the the doors are open, so people are both on the porch and inside, then it can be more than twenty five. <laughs> I believe it would have to come as a question from the chair. Can I answer that, Sarah? Or as long as Nancy nods, I think we're probably fine. Yeah. Yeah, the way that it's written is that as long as you're using both the indoor and outdoor space, the 25 would not apply. It would only apply, so imagine in winter, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. I think the way I interpret it is that you can't have more than 25 people inside. So if you have 30 people on your lawn and 25 inside, that would be consistent with this. Yeah, okay. okay. So you could I mean, have 55 it, people at an event but as long as only 25 are inside and the parking's not an issue. You're fantastic, I'm sorry. Um, so is it therefore implied that they could have an event of greater than 25 as long as that 25 was, that greater number was expanded beyond the parlor? 
Is that implicit here, or do, do we need to make that explicit? I believe that it is explicit in that may attend an event that is held inside the portion of the building dedicated to the private group assembly use. So if it was outside of that, like the lawn, to me that would be explicit. But I also read zoning codes for a living, so okay, and, that with a grain of salt. So, so we'll just assume that any number over 25, they walked to the event, which I'm fine with. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, so my first question is, um, the property owners, who, who owns this property? Yeah, so I own it with my husband. Okay, that you are MJP. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, then I have a question about the carriage house. Uh, is, this is an older structure to be called a carriage house. Is it essentially a garage? It is, um, yeah. Right now, it's storage. It's it's being used for storage. Um, so it's not being used for parking now. No, but it it could be if we find that that we need it, or if we get any complaints that that parking's tight. Okay, because you do meet the requirement with the graveled space in the back, uh, but it was mentioned as a seventh parking space, yeah, so I just yeah. had a question about that. And then um, in your visioning process, since we're talking about visions tonight, do you ever anticipate uh, developing the carriage house as a use for your readings or workshops or? Yeah, I mean, we, we, would, we would love to, <laughs> we would love to, to, to do that. Um, we don't have the the money to do the the renovations at this point, um, so so we're just kind of yeah kind of crossing we'll cross that bridge, um, I guess I guess if it comes. <laughs> Would that require? And then, and then yeah, unless that's something that. Well, yeah, I'm not sure. You know, we would. Yeah, in general, we we are thinking about okay. When we we bought the property, we thought, okay, there's this extra carriage house that could be useful in some way. So whether it's for um, it's for it's for reading or readings or just for you know, we would definitely work with the city to see what it could be used for. <laughs> you know, what uses were acceptable first, but. Um, I don't know, is that something that would require a special exemption again, or historic it, preservation invo involvement? Or? If the exterior was impacted, it would require historic preservation. Uh, you would likely have a building permit as part of that. Um, if you're expanding the group assembly use, that would require a special exception. Okay. So in order to use it for private yeah. group use, it would have to come back. Yep, any expansion of the use would require a new special exception. Okay. All right. Okay. That, those were my questions. Okay. So, what is your membership goal? Our membership goal, like I think um, you know, I think right now it's just 25. I think that's all we could kind of kind of handle. But is that sort of the uh, is that as large of membership as you want. Would you like more members, or do you feel 25 is an appropriate amount to have things work more successfully? Yeah, I think 25 is an appropriate amount. Um, we, yeah, like I, I said, we, we talk with um, the Iowa City Press Co-op that they have kind of a, a similar space. Actually, their space is a little bit bigger, um, and. Um, they usually have between 25 and 30 members. And we, we don't have 25 yet, we have 12, so, yeah. And how do you go about getting members? Well, we haven't done that yet because we were <laughs> up for this, <laughs> the, uh, this special exception. But, but um, uh, if, if we're granted this, then we'll go ahead and do a, a, a membership drive and look for, for new members, yeah. Um. 
How often do you have events, or what, are you planning on having events every weekend, once a month? Uh, work, you talk about workshops. Uh, yeah, yeah. So how much activity is going to be there, and how mm -hmm. many people are going to be involved? Yeah, okay. Um, so right now we have four programs. Um, there are three of them happen just once a month. So the first one is the free generative writing workshop um, that meets, oh gosh, the third Sunday of the month. Um, and that um, that's the one that draws our biggest, the biggest group. It's, it's hybrid, so people can join online, um, but We've been getting up to 20 people because it's it's some that's the one that's been in the community um, for about 10 years. So we what we was do. What's the name of that again? That that one's been in the community for a long for for 10 years. So we we do get about 20 people in the salon area for for that. Um, and then that's we. That's on a Sunday. Yeah, that's on that's Sunday. Uh, it's from 5:30 to 7. And the, the, the second one uh, that we just started is called the Long Project Check-In. Uh, it's sort of a support group for writers in the community who are working on projects over 30 pages. Um, it, they, that meets once a month. Um, oh gosh, I don't know, that's, I think that is, when is that, the third, is that the third? Third Saturday. I think that might be the third Saturday. No, that's the last Saturday of every month. <laughs> Sorry, and uh, it happens at uh, one o'clock. For how long? Um, that is two hours. Yeah. And that one is. Uh, we've had uh, six people at the most for that because that that one's just starting to get going. Um, and then the third one is Care and Spark, um, which is another kind of support group slash salon where um, parents who are artists, actually any kind of artist, um, can, can come and kind of share stories about managing or not managing parenthood and, and being an artist. Um, and uh, it's just, it's kind of a, a little networking group and, and just, yeah, a way to provide community for what can be kind of isolating job of being an artist and a parent. Yeah. And when does that meet? When does that meet? So that meets um, the first Saturday of every month at three. I just want to make sure the application and the recommendation isn't tied to these kinds of specific details. I just want to make sure that people aren't creating expectations that this will be the, no. the schedule of oh, events okay. or anything no. like okay. that. Yeah. What I'm so. interested in is how much activity is going to be there, how bigger groups are going to be there. Uh, is I mean, this appropriate for a residential area or is it getting But I think you need to assume that this information can and will change. Yeah. You know. But um, I get an idea of what right. they are interested in pursuing. Right. And like anything, yeah. it is never written in stone. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it, we also do a workshop um, every week that goes to a shelter house, um, not to shelter house itself, but um, kind of a, a satellite of shelter house. Um, it's, it's, what is it called? The, um, the Fairweather Lodge, where um, people have gone through some rehabilitation and are ready to kind of launch out and find housing. Um, and so this, you know, we, we my partner and I des designed this and we go every week, but, it, but we also um, kind of faci facilitate writers in the community who are interested in doing this kind of community service. They can come and see what we do um, and, and be a part of that as well. So, uh, but that doesn't happen there. And in, yeah, uh, um, and in terms of, of you know, more 
the other things that like the, the workshops or, or readings. Um, we are hoping that um, once we get our members, um, that the me that the members will decide. Um, okay, I want to have this kind of kind of reading with so and so, or I want to teach this kind of workshop. Um, so that's a little bit still up in the air. Um, I don't know how much demand there's going to be um, for for workshops. I mean, I think that the people who are interested in being in, t in teaching those already are um, are pretty are pretty well liked within the community. So I, I think they'll go, but I don't imagine that they'll be they'll be big big workshops. Um, and I don't imagine that the readings will be the kind of like I want even maybe as big as Prairie Light readings. I think they'll be more more intimate uh, uh, kind of invite invite your friends sort of vibe, but, yeah. Is the house going to be open uh, for drop-ins? I mean, is it, or is it going to be open only when there are events? Yeah, well, we were hoping to have community hours between 11 and 3 on Saturday. Um, and we have, that's what we have been doing, so we were hoping that we can continue with that. Um, when we have those community hours, we usually get about maybe one person <laughs> stops by every Saturday. So, um, but I think it's important, and my, my board thinks it's important that we, that we have that, that time for people who've heard about us or seen an event and maybe want to get involved to, to, check, to check in, so. And, um, and staff's interpretation is, again, as long as it's typically restricted to the public, that that would be appropriate. And if you think of it as a different use, uh -huh. let's say a church that would have, you know, people might show up every now and again, and that, as long as it's typically restricted, that's probably fine. Do we need to take a recess? Larry said he would be right back. Okay, I wasn't <laughs> sure if we were allowed to continue discussion if we don't have. Is three quorum or four? I don't know. It's three is quorum, but we usually require three in person due to complications that may arise with Zoom. Sure. I know, is he on there still? Is it Bryce? Bryce is still here. At least. He appears to be here from my perspective. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still here. Sorry. <laughs> Bryce, do you have any I was re I was reconnecting. <laughs> it dropped for 30 seconds. Do you have any questions, Bryce? No questions. Yeah, I see him coming. I'll back. ask, should I go ahead? Yeah, go I? ahead. Okay. So if, if you have ever had a, a larger group of any kind, how do you handle that? Do you find other spaces within the community to host your event or? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that, that would be a great idea. I mean, we do have online, you, you're supposed to, to register to come to events, okay. um, but we've never had, had it happen where <laughs> that many people have registered, so we've started to worry about that. So. Okay, well that's good, that, good yeah. to know that you have pre-registration. Yeah. Or, so that you'll be able to manage the 25 that are allowed within the building during winter and climate weather, right. those types of situations. Right, yeah, yeah. So basically what you're saying is that there is pre-registration for everything. So you know how many people are going to be there. Yeah, not everybody registers, but it does give us a kind of a, a, an idea of who might be coming. So, yeah. Do you have any more nope, questions, I'm Paula? Done. I'm Do you finished. have any questions? No, no more. <laughs> Bryce, are you there? Do you have any questions? Yes, I don't have any questions. I don't. Do we have any questions? Okay, thank you. So I think we've asked all the questions that we want from you. I do want to ask one question about the uh, bike 
Brack thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you don't object to you don't object to that. You know, I went over there today because yeah. when I first when I first read it and I saw the bike rack, I thought, okay, that's fine. And then I went over there, and uh, it's getting a bike up getting that yeah, yeah up from Washington yeah. Street is not very easy it would yeah. be better to go around and back yeah we would we would put it in the back and I think maybe we could install a <laughs> a sign on at, up, up at the front that says bike rack in in the back <laughs> um but yeah I mean that and that the bike rack does appeal appeal to me uh, because we would we, one of the reasons we chose this location is that we hope people would was on a bike route um, we hope people would bike and be able to walk um, and it was on a bus route as well so yeah it's a something a value that's important to me yeah. Yeah. So does anybody have any more questions for her no does anybody have any more questions for Kurt Okay. Is this the public hearing? Then yeah. I close the public hearing. No. Oh, you have a member of the public oh, I'm sorry. who want to speak. We actually have members of the public today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. You waited so patiently. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you're up. You're next. Hey, my name is Frank Gersh. I live at 1041 Woodlawn Avenue in Iowa City. That's about a block away from the Porch Light House. And um, I've lived there for 20 years. We moved over there because my old neighborhood on College Street was so noisy. Um, and so I hate noise, too, I agree <laughs> with Mr. Baker. Um, and so I've been observing Porchlight for two years since they moved in. Um, they've done a really great job uh, uh, exteriorly. Uh, they put a new roof on. It was kind of a rundown property before. It was painted white, solid white, um, and I don't think the landlord painted it even once in the last 20 years. Um, it's an 1893 house with really great trim, and so the white really didn't do it justice. You know, it requires different trim colors, and so porch light painted the trim. Uh, kind of a whimsical uh, turquoise color, but it does emphasize the, the trim and makes the house look more like it should have looked back in 1893. Um, they did a lot of uh, landscaping in the front yard, um, you know, lawn furniture, uh, bushes, flowers. To me, that's all an expression of goodwill. You know, they, they are willing to invest. They're willing to make things better. That's what it said to me. Um, I've been by probably every day. I walk downtown or walk around the neighborhood with my dog all different times of the day. I've never noticed anything noisy going on there. No parking problems, no crowds. There was one meeting on the lawn last summer that I think um, um, the owner talked about uh, there were maybe like 30, maybe 40 people there outside on the lawn. I was walking on the other side of the street. I couldn't hear what they were saying. I could hear, tell it was a reading. There'd be applause every now and then. This was about 6 o'clock at night. It wasn't loud. I mean, I couldn't, it would not have disturbed me if I'd lived across the street there. And I'm very sensitive to noise. Um, I've got to say that you know, a literary house is in keeping with the idea of Iowa City as a city of literature. I mean, it's a good idea from that standpoint. Um, personally, I love to read. I read a lot. I'm hoping to get some good ideas maybe from some of the writers there if I go over there. I haven't been to any events. My wife has been to two, and she's a writer. Um, and went to the writer's workshop and so on. Uh, I imagine she'll probably go to some more, but from a personal point of view, it's a, it's a benefit to me. So the, the, from both the exterior and the noise, um, from the city of literature point of view and from the personal point of view, I think it's 
a good thing, and I want to, I'm speaking in favor of the exception. That's all. Right, thank you. And you did sign in, correct? I did. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Thought you did right away. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> Better make sure there isn't anybody hiding. Okay. I don't need to stick around, do I? Only if you want to. <laughs> Okay, then uh, I close the public, the public meeting, and may I have a motion? I would recommend the approval of item EXC 23-0004 to allow religious private group assembly use in a neighborhood stabilization RNS 12 zone and to allow wide setback reductions to 15 feet and a rear setback reduction to 30 feet for the property located at 1019 East Washington Avenue, subject to the following conditions. No more than 25 persons may attend an event that is held inside the portion of the building dedicated to the private group assembly use. No outdoor events shall be held between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. No exterior amplified sound shall be allowed outdoors. And within six months of the date, a decision by the Board of Decision is filed with the city clerk Four bicycle parking spaces shall be installed on the property, subject property in compliance with the standards of Article 14-5A of the Zoning Code. Upon written request and for good cause shown, the board may extend this deadline without further public hearing on the merits of the original application. I second. Okay. So we can discuss? Yeah. Uh, I think it's a great idea, I, and, I, and I hope it succeeds uh, tremendously. I have one suggestion for one change in the uh, conditions, one word conditions. On number one, where it says no more than 25 persons may attend an event that is held inside the portion, uh, I would like to suggest that we say no more than 25 persons may attend an event that is held exclusively inside the portion of the building dedicated to the private group assembly use. That would be the only change I would recommend. And the reason for that is, are you trying well, to? Well, I, I think that, that more clearly allows a larger crowd outdoors. It's, it's restrict, that 25 number cannot be misinterpreted to include any other event, just the events held inside that space. I think, Kirk, did you and I discuss that? Um, I think that creates some ambiguity with regards to events that are held both in and out. Mm -hmm. um, and so. But then that wouldn't be exclusively inside the portion of the building. Right, but we still don't want, if I understand correctly, we don't want more than 25 people inside. Okay. Right even if it's a inside and outside party. Right. Wait a minute, that's, that's if it's the, the space inside plus the porch, you still want to restrict it to 25 period. Inside. The porch is outside. Well, that's one. Right, I still want it to be clear that even if you're holding an event inside and outside, you can't pack 80 people inside the house, right? Only 25 can be inside. All right. Okay, but I think, I mean, if there's a majority of the board that uh, agrees with this notion, you know, this, this uh, idea, I, Kirk and I can massage that language to make that clear. See, I, I see it just the opposite of being, creating ambiguity, it creates specificity, so. But I think it, it says, it creates the ambiguity um, in regards to the number of people allowed inside if it's an event that is held in and outside. It's not exclusively an indoor event. It's an event that is in and outside. So then how many people are allowed inside when it's not just an exclusively inside party? Right. And we want it to be 25 no matter what if it's inside, 25 people are allowed inside. 25 in that space. 
the indoor space. Right. Okay. Even if there's more outside. Even if there's more. I thought that's what the language did. It said, if you're using that space, that space is restricted to 25 people. When you say an event that's held exclusively inside, if it's not held exclusively inside, it opens the door to more people coming in. Inside that portion of the building dedicated to the private group assembly use. I mean, I, I, I'm I not going to make my stand on this hill, but. Um, I think Kirk and I, I mean, if that's the direction that you guys all agree on, we can um, clarify that. But I don't think the word. Uh, exclusively. Exclusively, you know, as a modifier in that location solves the problem. Okay, so are we back to the, under, the implicit understanding that they can have more people as long as it's not just in that room? Is that clear from this language without any changes? There's no restriction on the number of people that can be outside. Outside. You understand, that is your understanding now as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, and I think and I, you maybe want to make sure that say we have maybe 30, or but we say we have 40, 40 people. At an Jenny, 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 Jenny. So that we're somehow. Excuse me, could you come up to the. Uh, oh, can't hear you. What, no, but <laughs> so it's public should, hearing actually closed. should not yeah. allow okay. yes, she can. We speak because public the public. Is closed. Yeah, okay. the public hearing is closed. Yeah. So, I'm so sorry. if there are. Oh, I can't speak. No. Yeah. Okay. If there's 40 people at the party, only 25 can be inside. Correct. That's the idea. Yeah. Correct. Right. That's fine with me as long as. Yeah. I, I think mean, it's maybe maybe the solution to your concern is no more than 25 people may attend an event that is held inside the portion of the building dedicated to the private group assembly use. There is no limit on the amount of people, like add in that sentence. Yeah. I, well, that it kind of opens up a can of worms. Well, yeah. it makes it. <laughs> I don't want no it to limit. like, yeah. I mean, there Invite are. Invite it. Yeah. <laughs> there are. There are practical limitations, <laughs> and the nuisance ordinance yeah. would restrict There's that. There's all sorts of things, but. Yeah, right. Uh, we, I just, we, I think it's, personally, I think it's OK as it is. Okay. I, I think it's understood that it can be 25 inside. We're not touching the outside, because that's subject to other okay. city ordinances. OK. I mean, as long as it is an understanding and it's on the record that we have an understanding that this does not restrict outside attendance, a porch, for example. Right. Okay. That will definitely be clear in the minutes. Okay. Okay. I withdraw my recommendation. So I, I mean, I think that this does help stabilize the neighborhood. Um, it's, I think, a good infill use. You know, we often talk about infill development in the city, you know, revitalizing neighborhoods with um, new construction. And, and I see this as a good infill use of an existing building. And uh, it supports the strategic plan and the city of literature, and so I'm in support of it. I want to see it. I want to see it go. <laughs> I mean, I live, I live not too far from this. I want to see, and College Hill has problems, and I want to see it being recognized more as a neighborhood, and I think this would be a great step toward it. I want to make sure that it doesn't, get so out of hand that it becomes a problem. Uh, and this morning I listened on on public radio and there was a writer's uh, house over on Davenport Street for a long period of time, uh, which is no longer there. They've changed their organization. They were also talking about a writer's thing at Okaboji. I mean, these types of things right now are very popular. And so it would be really great to see one in our neighborhood. <laughs> uh, I'm just concerned. I don't want it to become a problem that, and, and therefore limit other, other types of things like this happening. Because I think it would be great 
that we would have things like this in the neighborhoods downtown say look at us look at what we can provide for writers and uh it's almost like a catch-22. We want this to be a great success, but not too great. <laughs> I, okay, so I've thought of some language. Maybe you might like this. Occupancy shall be limited to 25 people inside the portion of the building dedicated to the private group assembly use. Okay. Does that work? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. You're the lawyer. You tell me. <laughs> I'm not the decider, though. So. Okay. Um, any more discussion? I just I just wanted to say that I imagine it could happen, but I really don't see a group of writers becoming um, a, a group that will create problems oh, in the you neighborhood. you have not been to a good party. <laughs> well, these, these are not for parties. These are for readings. Okay. <laughs> Can I have the experience, Larry? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, zipping my lip. Good job. So does anybody else have any anything else they want to say? Any more discussion about this? As I, you know, I think this is a great idea. I want it to be successful. Uh, and I think if it's on a small scale, I think it can be successful. And, you know, and possibly, initiate another one uh, in the area. Okay, so would uh, someone like to read the... I think Larry's made the motion. I think you just call the question now. Well, finding a fact is the... Yeah, we have to Oh, do... gosh, you're right. <laughs> yeah, we have to do that. That is a more... Words of that here. Uh, and it has to be one of you. Uh, that's it. All right, okay. here we go. You, you Race is on. <laughs> <laughs> go for it. Rega well, one of you has to do it, and the oh. other has to second it. Okay, I, I did the first one, so. We'll okay. Um, regarding item EXC 23 0004. I concur with the findings set forth in the staff report of May 10th, 2023, and conclude that the general and specific standards are satisfied. Unless amended or opposed by another board member, I recommend that the board adopt the findings in the staff report for the approval of this application. Second. I like this. Back in my day, you had to like, everybody read everything. <laughs> like turns, said the whole staff report again, yeah, basically. I remember those days. Yeah. Um, so you had some recommended language for the number one on the conditions. Right. So how do we incorporate those? I mean, do well, you? If you want to amend your motion, your, me your motion was to amend subject to the conditions as originally stated. If you want to amend your motion to adopt the language that I stated. Um, you have that written down, right? I yeah, do, right, and know. it's on the record, so I do have it written down. Okay, so uh, I'd like to amend my motion to um, approve the recommendation uh, by changing the conditions and language, uh, the language of condition number one to reflect the um, suggestion of the uh, city attorney, X, Y, and Z, whatever that was. I mean to restate it? Uh, the first condition would then read, occupancy shall be limited to 25 people inside the portion of the building dedicated to the private group assembly use. Great. So second. Yep. Okay. Vote. Baker. Yes. Carlson. Yes. Parker. Yes. Russo. Swigard. Yes. The motion is declared approved. Any person desiring to appeal this decision to a court of record may do so within 30 days after this decision is filed with the city clerk's office. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it made yeah. my, my evening. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, we're so past no. that now, sadly. Best of luck to you. Good luck, yes. Okay, so uh, are there any corrections for the minutes of April 12th? If oh, not, I don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> if Usually not, I do, yeah. but no. If <laughs> not, may I have a motion to accept the minutes? So moved. Second. Simple vote, yes. 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 Okay. Now, I have a question about the motion to accept the minutes of April 19th. Can we do it with just Paula and I here? Do we need to have three? So you have three. Even though Larry wasn't there, he's still able to count his quorum well, and vote on the minutes. I can vote on it. I can. A, a, or Bryce can vote on them as well, and you would still have three votes, and we still okay. have a quorum, so it doesn't make a difference either way. Okay, so may I have a motion to accept the minutes of April 19th? So moved. Second. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So are there any other things we Bryce, need? Bryce, those are both yeses for you too, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so are there any other things we need to discuss? Uh, <laughs> yeah. We're going to get you to better parties. <laughs> but my only... Oh, no, I'm rethinking this bunch of writers party thing. <laughs> my, uh, my only uh, announcement tonight is just we may have a meeting June 14th. Uh, the deadline is this Friday at noon, so I'll let you know uh, by Monday as to whether or not we'll have that meeting. Uh, if we do have a meeting, I'll still join as the secretary to help out with procedural things, uh, but it would be a different staff person presenting. So... Um, doing if, the reports and that. Yeah. And if not, uh, then the next meeting is July 12th. So, like I said, I'll let you know by Monday. Fast, we only meet once a month. Okay. May I have a motion to adjourn? Bryce, would you like to do that? Uh, motion to adjourn, then. Second. Yes. 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 <laughs>